welcome to our faculty to faculty second session of fall 21. Uh, we are joined today by Dr. John Rovers um, to speak and talk about experiences of global engagement as it relates to community development and public health. Um, and so we'll just kind of get started with um, a quick overview. So if you want to tell folks, um, how did you get into this work in the first place? What's a little bit of your background? Okay. Um, I guess the biggest thing to know is I get bored fast. Um, so um, would have been maybe 12 or 13 years ago now, maybe uh, longer, maybe that uh, David Skidmore and uh, Deb Daylot had gotten a Title VI-A grant from the U.S. Department of Education uh, to globalize the university. And most schools that were getting similar grants were using that to hire you know, an area scholar in, in you know, um, you know, colonial history of sub-Saharan Africa or something. Uh, what was decided on the Drake campus was we would use that money to try and create essentially a environment where the campus was going to take on a more global nature and that there would be opportunities for students and faculty and staff to be involved with this. And um, my background is in healthcare, but I'd always looked at healthcare as something from 30,000 feet rather than sitting up at night worrying about your potassium. And so I thought, well, you know, given that it seems to be the way that, that um, the health program side of this will be running, I went back to school in 2009, 2010 and did a master's in international public health. And so I came back from that in 2010 with an MPH with some sort of formal academic background in in health in the developing world and how to sort of approach work that could be done in that environment and have been working more or less in that space ever since. All right. And <clears throat> excuse me, can you tell us a little bit about what that work here specifically at Drake has looked like in the last recent years uh, globally? Yeah, um, right now, uh, what it's been looking at mostly is uh, from a sabbatical project that I was started in 2000. 17. Um, I went to Belize for six months. Um, the college, my college does have a rotation site uh, for P4 students to uh, do part of their clinical training at Hillside Clinic, which is a small American run non governmental organization in southern Belize. Um, it sound, I sound a bit like Sarah Palin, but I literally could see Guatemala from my porch. Uh, we were that far south in Belize. It's the poorest region in the country. Belize is actually an upper middle income country by, uh, by World Bank standards, but this part of Belize is, is relatively poor. Um, and it was suggested uh, by people working in the area that I undertake a men's health project. So I spent uh, six months basically in uh, the Toledo district uh, gathering information. It's mostly qualitative research. Uh, to identify uh, priorities for men's health in, uh, in Belize. To make a long story short, um, their, their take on health as males is different than uh, women. The, the, the health data would suggest that the hospital, for instance, sees a fair number of women. Uh, most of that's for childbirth, but relatively few men. And so by the time all was said and done, uh, we identified four sort of key themes coming out of this is that these guys had really quite poor health literacy. Uh, they have on paper adequate access to health resources. So if they needed a dentist, there was a dentist available. If they needed eyeglasses, there's a place to get eyeglasses. If they wanted to see the doctor, they could see the doctor. Uh, but what that usually meant was giving up a day's work in the fields, getting on the bus, coming into town, and essentially giving up a day to undertake, you know, whatever it happened to be. Yeah. Um, and the majority of men were not willing to give up that time. So the, the access exists on paper, but not necessarily in any meaningful sense. Yeah. You know, there are community health workers in the villages, but their, their skill set and what they can do is relatively limited. So poor health literacy on paper good access that didn't always mean anything, uh, that they do not prioritize um, health problems well at all. Um, they have a basic understanding of some of them, but they don't really understand the risk of them there. Uh, 
as, as well. So they don't prioritize risk well, and they don't they don't understand sort of what are the consequences of um, a health issue. I mean, one thing I was asking was getting at addictions and, you know, what are the consequences of drinking too much? Well, the only answer I got back was when you get a headache, mm -hmm. you know, the thought that you, the thought that you may end up with liver failure was just not part of the discussion. Wow. So I came back from that. And then um, the plan was to create a screening program for, hypertension and diabetes, which the data suggested were the largest uh, problems that men had. It's a young country. Uh, the average population is still well below the age of 35, and it's still a significant issue. And so these are chronic illnesses that if they're not sort of nipped in the bud early, are going to be a significant um, cost um, and deleterious effect on you know both the economy and on the, on the patients uh, as these things get worse. Yeah, and I know students were involved in that, but before we, we jump into what their role has looked like, can you tell us a little about um, how, how did you uh, start the partnership and who did you work with? Um, because I, you know, I imagine like you didn't just show up in Belize and walk around with, with a clipboard. Um, so how did you gain access and what did that partnership development piece look like? Uh, a number of years ago, uh, Des Moines University had an evening presentation on global health. Uh, and I attended that. And one of the speakers was from an organization called Hillside Clinic. And so this is a, this is, as I said, it's a small American run non-governmental organization that is set up just outside the town of uh, Toledo, about a six mile bus ride out of Toledo. Um, and they were describing what they do. Their, their model is essentially they bring in senior level students in various health disciplines that are to a certain degree autonomous. They can, they can, they can practice autonomously under supervision. Yeah. Um, and so they're, they're there 12 months a year. So they're, they're an ongoing presence there. Uh, and I thought that was a pretty cool model. And I asked a question at the end of this of the session, have you ever worked for pharmacists? And the answer was, well, give me a business card and we'll talk. Um, so, uh, at the time I, I turned that initial discussion over to, uh, Denise Soltis, who at the time was our director of experiential training here in the college. And she essentially, uh, got the, got a rotation site off the ground. So we, I, I had kind of a built-in, uh, network to plug into. I went down separately, sort of, it's more on my own rather than anything specifically related to, um, what students would be doing. And it was kind of interesting. I had a sabbatical plan and I went down there and met with uh, the staff at Hillside um, who were like, oh, that'd be great. We really look forward to working with you. can hardly wait till you get here. And then on the 1st of August, all that staff changed over. Oh, wow. And I, I had to go back in October and was like, who are you? What do you want? Uh, <laughs> So uh, I, 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 the good news is I could plug in fairly quickly because there was existing infrastructure that at least the university had had some relationship with. Um, and so it was suggested by um, the folks working in that clinic that a, uh, a men's health project would probably be welcome because realistically men don't come to care if they do come to care, it's clearly because something is horribly, horribly wrong. Uh, and by, by the time they come to care, it's often, you know, you're stage four cancer now. There's really nothing left to do. Right. Right. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that you point out the an established kind of infrastructure or relationship already held with the college and the, the university as a whole. Um, many times we don't we don't start there. And so being able to emphasize that relationship that's been built and then add capacity to the need that maybe hadn't been explored yet. I think yeah, I, I think every piece of international work I've done was a function of somebody knew somebody who could make an introduction. Uh, and things will, things can go surprisingly well from there. But yeah, you're right. You, can, you can't just show up and go, hi, here I am. I'm ready to help. Right, right. So can you tell us a little bit more then about how, so you, you made the partnership, um, worked with them to identify a need that you, that your expertise could assist with, and then you got students involved. What did their involvement look like? 
Well, we came back from it, as I said, with the uh, belief that uh, a screening program for hypertension and diabetes would be the most appropriate thing to do. Um, and initially, that was work that I had done with um, a group of second year, second professional year occupational therapy students. Um, they do some very interesting work over in OT uh, that sort of overlaps with what I was doing from a public health perspective. And so what they did, they did great work to actually won a, a campus-wide award for this work, um, was create uh, training materials for the uh, community health workers. So these are local Belizeans who would be in those villages who could then um, undertake the work to actually measure a blood sugar, measure a blood, uh, a blood pressure, keep records and that kind of stuff. So they created training materials for those individuals. And the next step that I was going to do is I was planning on flying back to Belize with the training materials, as well as a box full of blood pressure cuffs and glucose meters and essentially sort of get to work getting, getting that part of the, of the uh, project done. And then unfortunately COVID hit uh, and I've not been back to Belize since January of 2020. Um, but the 2020 trip pointed out, again, you have to take your, you have to take your lead from the locals. Um, because I, I got, you know, I, when I was in Belize in 2017, I put together an advisory committee and it was more along the lines of, look, this is what I'm hoping to do, but you have to tell me, is this culturally appropriate? Is this feasible? Is this appropriate? What objections would people have? Like, where are the bear traps that, that I don't know about in Belizean culture that you can help me with? And it was not onerous work for them, but you need to make sure that you make it clear that their job is advisory, not doing the project, because most of them have full-time jobs and they don't want to get further involved with that. Um, but between that advisory group and conversations I was having with the Ministry of Health, yeah, the screening program looked like a good idea to do. The question was, well, how do you go about doing that? How does that happen? And nobody had any good ideas. So in January 2020, I went back and I thought, you know, I am going to be the guy with the clipboard in the, in the town square. Uh, <laughs> And I just walked around the town square for a couple of days, introducing myself, saying, hi, my name is this, and here's what I've been doing. Um, and this is, if this is what we're going to do, how would, how would you do that? What do you, what, what do you want to see done? And really didn't get much in the way of good answers from people. I think they really struggled with like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Finally, talking to this one guy, he's maybe 23, 24 years old. Uh, and he says, oh, dude, you're going about this completely ass backwards. Uh, <laughs> I'm all ears. Tell me more. Um, and D Belize is a remarkably diverse country in terms of different ethnic groups. Um, and that part of the country, especially once you get outside of Punta Gorda, the, the main town, is largely Mayan. And in Mayan culture, they have something called an alcalde, which is for lack of a better word, it's, it's, it's a sort of civic infrastructure where it's a little bit kind of like the town council and it's also a little bit like the rules of engagement for living in this community. Yeah. And so they have a, um, a, a regular event. I'm not sure whether it's every month or every six months or whatever, but uh, they will put on one of these events and every able-bodied man in the community is expected to participate. And so they do things like they'll cut down all the weeds that are overgrowing the town. They'll repaint the school. They'll pick up trash. And, you know, maybe the church needs some repair on the roof or whatever it happens to be. And all able-bodied men are expected to participate. So this young Belizean gentleman says to me, all you have to do is sort of get one into the villages, um, get a relationship started with the village chairman, the kind of equivalent to the mayor. And I'd met some of those guys to begin with. And if you get them on board, it's just a matter of, well, great. When they have a next time they have an alcohol day, all you have to do is show up and these guys will be required to participate. Uh, so that's going to be the next step if I can ever get down there again. Gotcha. So <clears throat> what have been some of your, your key learnings? We talked about partnership yeah. development, certainly working with, 
you know, people on the ground and in the home country um, because we were outsiders. Um, what else is there? If you were, if, if faculty are listening that are exploring a global engagement, particularly as it relates to kind of the community yeah. development side, what are the uh, landmines? <laughs> uh, yeah, there are, there are a number of things that I think that I picked up from this and, and, and some of them I expected and some of them I really didn't. One that I would have expected, it's a term from epidemiology where when you want, you know, you want to bring about something, some outcome or you're looking at why something may have happened, the conditions need to be both necessary and sufficient. And so I don't think it matters whether you're doing service learning or community engaged learning with a group of, of you know, Drake students in Belize or whether you're doing that with, uh, with a group of Drake students and a Hmong population here in Des Moines. I, you know, I don't think that matters. Uh, but people go into this um, with a great sense of, you know, belief of, you know, service and whatever else and, you know, wanting to give back. And that is necessary, but it is not necessary and sufficient. Uh, there are other things that you need to have in place to sort of make this go. Um, and the first thing that I would say is the, the, the first kind of conversations you're having with whoever your target group that you would like to work with is arrive with questions, not answers. That's a good one. Um, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I mean, if we're, you know, if we're Drake faculty, we're educated, intelligent people. Uh, we think we understand something. We think we know something. And uh, let's face it, we spend our days at the front of the room telling people things that they don't know. Uh, and if you start off with a community engagement kind of service in that area, it is going to blow up in your face. Um, and so this is something where it's much more along the lines of, you know, what, what, um, what can we do to help? Um, and so, I mean, I use an example that I came across. This is, thank God this didn't happen to me, but it was something I read on a, I came across on a PBS news hour or something where an age, so an age, an aid group arrives, I think it was in Namibia. And they were expecting to do the usual stuff, which, you know, health education or public health or run a clinic or um, public, you know, microfinance feeding programs for hungry children or whatever. Um, and they were stunned to find out that the request, what the, what the locals wanted to work on was they wanted a post office. Yeah, very different uh, thoughts. There would, there would have not been a health and development professional on the planet that would have come up with that as the highest priority in a million years. Right. Um, so you, you have to come uh, with questions rather than answers. It's not, hi, we're here to do this. It's, hi. We're here. We hope we can help. Let's talk and find out if we have areas of mutual interest to, to, to work on. Um, and so the first thing that I did when I got there is I set up this advisory committee. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they were, they were supportive. They basically agreed with, with what I was talking about. One of the, I think one of the things that I struggled with with the advisory committee, though, is, again, as I said, Belize is very uh, ethnically diverse. Um, and that part of the country is mostly Mayan, but everybody on my advisory committee was Garifuna. Mm. So, you know, so they're essentially, Mayans are essentially the indigenous population in Central America. Garifuna are Afro-Caribbean black. Um, and they tend to be more living in town. The Mayans tend to be living more in, in the villages. And I was never 100% sure that that mattered or didn't matter. So that'd be one thing like, you know, what's the, what's the power dynamic or the, the, the dynamic in your community is set up an advisory committee. But that'd be the first thing I would have people do is set up some sort of an advisory group doing as best as you can to make sure you've got adequate representation of you know, all voices. And it's not always easy to do. It, 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 it took me six weeks to set up an advisory committee. Yeah. Um, you know, and I was there, and I was, did you work through Hillside um, or how did you no. find different people? Well, I worked uh, sort of in parallel with Hillside. A uh, gentleman down there, Matthew Nicasio, is their public health director. Matthew, or as everybody calls him, Mr. Nick, maybe he's got to be one of the smartest human beings I've ever come across. There is nobody he doesn't know. There is no thing he doesn't know. 
Um, and he's a local man who was a public school teacher for many, many years and came across a second career as a public health worker. He got a public health degree from the University of West Indies in, in uh, Jamaica. Uh, and he was my guiding light through this whole thing. So, well, you know, let's talk to these people and say if they want to be a member. Let's talk to those guys and say, oh, these guys don't want to do it. How about that person over there? Yeah. And so we put the committee that way. Um, kind of like, just like when you do traditional research, I mean, he was your gatekeeper in many ways. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, this, this thing would have never gotten off the ground when we heard from Matthew. Uh, and for what it's worth, I mean, he's a full time paid employee of Hillside Clinic. Okay. So there was money that did change hands between my research funds and Hillside to essentially reimburse Hillside for the time that he was spending during his normal work hours on my work. Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing to keep in mind is a lot of the work actually got done on weekends because that's when guys are home. Right. Otherwise, they're in the field. You, you know, you're not going to get them on a Tuesday afternoon. Right. So a lot of data collection was done on a Sunday. Hmm. And so Matthew had a vehicle and I would, I would simply pay him for time and gas uh, for his time. He's like, you know, um, he's not a charity. Yeah. Um, so put that together. Uh, the other kinds of things, how well do your need, how well do their needs match your capabilities? Very good point. Um, I'm not sure that every potential partnership should be acted upon. You know, if, if your skill set is not consistent with what they need, probably shouldn't be doing this. And I've seen that with, oh, there's lots of sort of voluntourist groups that go out there and do all kinds of things. And some of them just leave me shaking my head. Um, so I don't know that all partnerships should be created. And I guess the other thing would be flexibility is absolutely key. Whatever you think you're going to do, that will not survive the first conversation you have. Um, be prepared for this to take on a rather different shape than what you thought you might otherwise be doing. Um, as I said, you know, you go there, you're expecting well, maybe they want a well or a public health program or they want a post office. Um, you go, we're not the post office people. You don't need to talk to somebody else about that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> could, yeah. I, could, I enter, could I interest you in a fluoridation program? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, well, I mean, that, that, that's, that's what I've been doing, and that's sort of what I've taken home from it. Uh, it really is. I, I don't like the term servant leadership. There's a lot in this kind of world that is more explicitly religious than I think probably has to be. Um, I kind of look at this. You, you want to try and lead from the rear is maybe the best way that I would say it. Um, cause the road, the road to bad places are paved with good intentions sometimes. And this kind of work would be a pretty good example. Yeah. I mean, and so many parallels to what you've said apply domestically as well. And yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, I don't think there's anything magic about the fact that this happened in Belize. I think the, I think the processes and the problems are probably the same. You could be, you know, doing a Polk County and have the, the same issues to deal with. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate your time because you've pointed out some really good nuggets um, of information and, and some hard truths. Like, I love that you're willing to go on record and say, hey, if, you're, if your needs and their needs don't match, like, you probably shouldn't pursue this. Um, because many times we, it, it's hard to, to be truthful that way, just acknowledge that your, your idea may not be going forward. I think especially because we're working with students, we want to give those, we want to give our students opportunities and that they can learn from. Um, and sometimes it's just not going to work. And I guess maybe one other thing I probably would have would add it now that I think of it. Um, have a plan in mind that what are you going to do if this thing lays an egg? What are you going to do if it blows up? Yeah. And the best I can say is, at least in my case, um, this thing has been put together in such a way that if it crashes and burns, I'm not taking anybody with me on the way now. There's nobody that has got so much invested time-wise or resources or emotional investment that if it crashes and burns in Belize, nobody's going to be crying the blues. I'll be sad that I didn't get a project done, mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to be the only one who's going to oh, go bad for that. Yeah. 
Well, it goes to that, that phrase. I'm not sure where this comes from, uh, maybe the sustainability community, but uh, do no harm. I mean, I think there's probably lots of people who, who have adopted that phrase, but above all else, do no harm. Um, well, or as little harm as we can. It's an old medical phrase, nil nisi bonum, nothing unless good. There you go. And that's very fitting for a global public health health project. Yeah. I think the other piece is I'm thinking about my role as um, community engaged learning office and then our partnership with Drake International. Two things that just to be to clarify even stronger is you know, going back to the time it took just to set the advisory committee. That was well after all of the time it took just to even invest the partnership and the location and all of that. And so um, for faculty that are exploring this, um, invitation to explore it early. Um, we have faculty fellows out of the, the Office of uh, Global Engagement who are willing to meet. We have a Global Service Learning faculty fellow willing to meet, um, obviously other staff in both community engaged learning and in Drake, in, uh, Drake Global. We're willing to, to start these conversations early mm -hmm. so that what you're talking about like if we get into this and we realize that it's not a good fit for either the partner or the, the course or the faculty member um, that we, we might have some time to pivot um, and I think the other piece too is faculty come in with as you mentioned um, your own ideal project or idea for your students um, and if you were to discover that it wasn't a good fit um, the perspective I bring is that, well, you are one of a much larger campus. And so there's possibility, maybe it doesn't work for your discipline or your course, but um, this might be an opportunity then at the university level for us to start expanding partnerships across disciplines. Um, not that that's yeah. your responsibility to hand that off, but the more we can be involved earlier on, um, the more likely we are to develop that kind of depth and have a, a backup plan if, if needed. And that, that actually was part of what, you know, my initial um, sabbatical project was to have included. We were lucky that we got a Nelson grant to do that kind of work. Mm -hmm. And at the time it was myself, uh, Tom Westbrook, who has since uh, retired and Dan Alexander, who just retired very recently. Um, and the planning was that all three of us had either work that we were doing or hoping to do in Belize. And this was to try and set up a mechanism by which maybe you would have one Drake faculty member down there, but having at least some supervisory capacity to be looking after your own students as well as somebody else's so that you yeah. didn't have this giant Drake footprint stomping across Belize. <laughs> um, you know, um, here we are, we're ready to help kind of thing. And um, that part of the project never really quite got off the ground. Um, uh, Dan was hoping to uh, set up uh, work with his data analytics students mm -hmm. and the Ministry of Health and um, Hillside Clinic sort of doing a, um, bring, bringing their data systems up to date, basically. And yeah. make a very long story short, the, the infrastructure, it, it was simply not going to let that happen so that part of it kind of did not happen but if nothing else though i've still continued to work with dan in other set in other settings for work that has been done down there and other things so it kind of got to what you said a minute ago realistically if it's not my skill set is it somebody else's skill set and as faculty are proposing to do this kind of work i would really hope that they would do it uh in groups of two three or four and ideally across disciplines rather than having, you know, three English professors or four pharmacy professors all doing the same thing, yeah. better off you would have some, some cross-disciplinary thing because the students are going to come at it from that perspective. You are likely to have students from across the university. Oh, yeah. and a, a deeper, richer experience for them too. Um, last thing I want to end on, you mentioned the Nelson um, Institute helped fund some. What are other resources of funding you have been able to tap into to help um, you with your project? Uh, yeah, that's going to start to be an issue in the next little while, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, at, at one point, I had a, um, I, still, I, I still have the job title, but uh, it was an endowed professorship that came with research funds, uh, but that, that was time limited. So I was able to use uh, uh, research funds that came with an endowed professorship for 
a number of years, uh, and that has since um, uh, essentially expired. Uh, Dean Chestnut has uh, very, very kindly uh, given me some bridge funding that, to take us sort of through this project. And if other things are going to happen, well, at that point, I'm going to be looking for grants the same as anybody else. Okay. So what I'm hearing is uh, work with your dean, possibly if you're not an endowed chair, there may be um, some support, um, external grants, um, and then even internally. So if faculty aren't aware, we have the Nelson Institute, um, which has some research funds available for faculty. Drake Global has some travel funds um, for faculty in the early stages looking to explore partnerships abroad. Um, and then Office of Community Age Learning and has some seed funding for supplies and other expenses related to uh, particularly global service learning um, as it relates to these kinds of experiences. So um, check all of those out. Um, and yeah, any, any last parting words of wisdom that you'd want to share? It's rewarding work. It, it, it really is. Um, we, we, we live in such a difficult time that it's sort of nice to realize that, you know, people have a lot more in common than they don't. Um, and to develop something in the way of a meaningful relationship with people you wouldn't normally otherwise see. Um, and if you are doing this from sort of a, well, my background is health and development, you know, yours may be something else, but um I just look at it as a little bit too. It's just trying to keep some karmic balance with the universe. You know, I'm not patting myself on the back that I'm saving the world, but if I can move a grain of sand or two that, that is of some use to somebody else, I'll take that. Well, wonderful parting words. Well, thank you for your time, John. Appreciate it. And You're most welcome. If faculty are interested in learning more about your project or connecting with you, um, how can they reach you after? Yeah, just send me an email. It's probably the easiest thing. John.rovers at drake.edu. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you. And I uh, okay. hope you enjoy the rest of your day.